Test, test. Test. Test, test, test. Test, 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 no. She probably did. Oh, there we go. What was it? Something wasn't on? Okay. Thank you. Test, test, test. Good.
Sure, but. The what? Bob. Yes. COVID again? What did she break her hip or her uh, she leg? She broke a femur above her uh, groin, you know, hip and groin. She had real, really, really bad pain after she had taken that hip. She did. Hmm. So, uh, I had <laughs> well, let me mention a few prayer requests to get started here, <clears throat> and then you can add to these. Uh, continue to pray for Beacon that uh, God would raise up a, a pastor to take that church. Uh, to free up, free up Pastor Jenkins. Continue to pray for Mike Wagner. He's still at uh, rehab, <clears throat> but it might become a permanent thing. Riverview is where he's at, over off of uh, Columbia Road. So just pray for him that they can get this uh, uh, urinary tract infection business straightened out. Pray for uh, Doug Babbitt. The last I heard, they had moved him to... Um, the VA hospital, and then they had to move him back to UH. I think, if I heard it right, that he might have an infection in his brain. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we'll get a little update when Bob comes. Uh, so pray, continue to pray for Doug Babbitt. He was showing a little bit of signs of um, responding to things, opening his eyes and stuff, and moving parts of his body, but <clears throat> they say that sometimes that can just be uh, after effect reaction. Uh, things might not change. Continue to pray for Ed and his uh, rehab on his back. And uh, his cousin, Mike, who has Parkinson's, and also for his salvation. Continue to pray for D. Anthony. She's still not able to get up and get around. Uh, pray for Doug Davis. I understand he's back in the hospital. I think with pneumonia, if I heard it right. And then uh, pray for Pat's mom. She fell, uh, broke her femur. And now Pat said this morning that she also is, she went to rehab and has COVID. So pray for her. Continue to pray for Zolt and uh, the aftermath of his uh, treatments. Anybody else? Yes. This is for Darlene's sister Laura. sister, Laura. She's in a nursing home now. Her daughter put her in a nursing home. <clears throat> and then also for her children. Not sure about the salvation situation, but that they would get saved if they're not saved. And uh, if, if they are, that they'd get back to their relationship with the Lord. Pray for Zolt and Agnes. I notice that they're sipping, uh, sitting on separate sides of the room. So just pray that that would get straightened out before the class is over with. But... Um, for those that are, uh, the, the lesson, faith on display in hard times. So this, this goes right along with, oh, they're, they're straightened out. You have an update, Bob, on? Uh, yeah, the patient called this morning and said, uh, it's going to uh, go to the gym. Go into the, yeah. right, oh. And uh, they knocked him out and whatever, and I think, I think everything so far is okay, but, uh, you know. They had, it sounds like they had to go back into the brain area for whatever, but uh, continue to pray for Doug that he, that God would do, a, it's going to take a miracle that God would do a miracle there as far as he's concerned. Anybody else? Carol? 
pray for Carol, 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 for her, for her own health and then also for her family. Anybody else? Anybody else? <clears throat> okay. I'm trying to think if there was um. No, can't remember. Pray for my memory. <laughs> ben, ben, would you open us, please, in a word of prayer? Amen. Okay. Today's lesson, the title of it is Faith on Display in Hard Times. Faith on Display in Hard Times. Um, and, and just to kind of remember, uh, I know that uh, we, we know this, but sometimes when the difficult times come, we, we can tend to forget it if we're if we're not careful, and if we get caught up in, the, in the, uh, the trial that we're going through. But God uses those trials to try to mature us as Christians. Um, I just wrote down here that trials are a part of life. Everybody has trials, and it's a part of life. But what it is, and that we don't look at it this way, and I hope that you can see this from the lesson today, that the trials are actually a very important part of life. Um, the... The challenges that come our way, the trials that come our way, whatever word you want to use, uh, keep in mind whenever that happens that God is the one that has allowed those things to come your way and that God wants to use those things. I'm going to read the passage. It's, it's found in James chapter 1, and it's the first 12 verses of, of chapter 1. <clears throat> it says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Before I forget, that's what I had forgot to remember. Uh, pray for Larry and Joyce Sedlak. Um, they're both are still not feeling well. They've both been having some health problems. So continue to pray for them, if you would, please. Um, James chapter 1, starting in verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, <clears throat> and it shall be given unto him, or given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven of the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways." Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, because as a flower of the glass, grass he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Um, before I get into the lesson, another prayer request that just kind of came to mind as I was reading is Sandra Williams asked for prayer. She's traveling with Mike and Diana. They're going to uh, visit some family and stuff in West Virginia, so pray for that situation also for safety. <clears throat> so as we look into the book of James here, uh, talking about uh, trials and talking about our faith, and... Uh, whether you think about it or not, your faith is on display every day. 
to the people around you. And uh, how you react when things get tough, it does make a difference. Uh, if, if people see you, if people know that you're trying to witness and talk to them about the Lord Jesus Christ, and then tough times come and you lose it, uh, it's going to affect the way that they respond. Are they really going to want to believe in a God that is, is, can't handle the situation that you're going through right now? God can handle any situation. Um, I want to move down to verse 2. <clears throat> the first one is giving a description of, of himself there. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and then he's writing this letter to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Greeting. And then he says in verse 2, My brethren, count it all joy when you, <laughs> when you fall into diverse temptations. Um, is there anybody in here that has attained to be able to count it joy that you have a trial your, come your way? Not, don't raise your hands all at one time. For those of you at home that can't see, nobody's got their hands raised, at least at this point. I, would, I want to read a, a, a passage in the book of 2 Corinthians. This is the Apostle Paul. And um, I would love to, I guess I would love to get to the point that Paul is at here. But I know, <laughs> unfortunately, I know to get there, God has to take you through some trials. God has to take you through some tough times. But I want you to see that although you face those things, there's hope. There's hope in them. And God can take you to the place that, that, that Paul is describing here that he's at. Um, I'm not there. I don't, I don't know of too many people that are, but it would, it would be a wonderful thing to be able to attain to this. It's found in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to start reading in verse 6. Every time I read this, I just kind of, I, I get amazed at his, his attitude, his response in times of difficulty, but I see why uh, also contained in this passage of Scripture. I'm going to start reading in verse 6 through verse 10. It says, For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure, verse 7, and lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. You know, I guess different people have different capacities as far as how much um, knowledge that you have. And different people have different knowledge in different areas. And we should never look down on anybody that has, uh, doesn't have quite maybe as much schooling as you do, doesn't have as many letters after their name as you do, if they have any at all. Uh, but th there's, a, there's, a, there's a danger sometimes when a person gets very educated, uh, and that is they get puffed up in themselves. They start to think of themselves more than they really are. And uh, Paul, I believe, is describing this here, that because God revealed so much to him, that there, and he knew it, he acknowledged it here, I believe, um, that there's a danger in getting prideful because you have so much uh, input from God. Um, and he knew that what came his way came his way because God was going to use that to keep him humble. And there's, there's, again, there's nothing wrong with it. In a case like that, possibly most people that, that are experiencing some affliction Maybe, not, maybe aren't even paying attention to the fact that because they're so um, gifted in the area of being able to see some things that God has let them see in Scripture, uh, Paul actually in Scripture and in other ways in, in person, um, it can lead to a life of pride, thinking that you're better than someone else. A Christian ought not to think himself better than anybody. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you have doctorates and... and, and, and uh, masters and whatever you have, you're not better than anybody else. Nobody is, just because you have some letters after your name. In fact, I would say that, unfortunately, sometimes people that have so many letters after their name don't have a lot of good experience as far as life is concerned. There's, there's wisdom that you can gain, and it's not from books. It's from God taking you through some of these experiences. And that's what I see here, is that the Apostle Paul was taken through some things. The wisdom that he attained was the fact that he knew 
and he reminded himself, and he actually got to the point where he relished, he joyed in it, that God was taking him through these things so that he could see God in a way that nobody else could. When you, when you go through a particular trial, God will show himself to you that I may never ever see it, or anybody else in this room may never ever see it, may never experience it, because God has allowed that specifically in your life, and he wants to show himself real to you. Uh, we're living in a day where a lot of people are scoffing at the fact that God is real. You see that in the way that, uh, that uh, their lives are being lived. And that's why it's so important for a Christian to live the kind of a life that God called him to live. A, faith, a life of faith. Trusting him no matter what we face. Um, and and I, th I think sometimes about the, the trials that come your way, and they can certainly overwhelm you. You know, I was talking to a, a lady again this morning. I've, I, in fact, I... Forgot to mention her in that uh, prayer request, Mrs. Norris. Uh, it's somebody that we helped. The church has helped. That's how I got to meet her in the first place. The church has helped her in the past. And um, she, had, she was the one that said to me at one time, and she remembered in the conversation we had this morning, uh, she said she struggles with some sort of depression, clinical depression. And <clears throat> we got in a discussion about trusting Christ as Savior. She says, I've done that. <clears throat> But in the same conversation, <clears throat> she said, your God can't handle depression. She said that to me. And in case you weren't here when I first mentioned it, what little hair I have left on the back of my head went up. <laughs> I can't, I can't, uh, I just can't stand there and listen to somebody speak against God that way. It's not that God needs me to defend him. But when somebody says that and then they claim to be a Christian at the same time, those two things in my limited understanding don't make sense that they go together. <clears throat> she said something to me this week. She said she wanted to come to church. I said, okay, just call, I'll call you or you call me on, on Sunday morning <clears throat> and, um, and I'll just make sure that you're coming so that uh, I'll come and get you. Well, I called her this morning and she said, no, not coming. That was it. Well, then she called me back a few minutes later. <clears throat> And she went on to explain to me the only reason she was coming. She said, I'm, not, I'm a Catholic, and I, I've always been a Catholic. I want to stay a Catholic. I don't want to change from being a Catholic. She was implying to me, she actually said to me, that she doesn't want to change to be a Baptist because she feels that she should be a Catholic. But why was she doing it? Because she wanted to please me, because I've been doing things for her. I've been helping her with things. And she feels obligated to try to respond in, in a way that... She offers me money a lot of times. I don't take it. And um, she, she wants to do something to please me. I said, that's no reason to come to church. I said, there, there's no reason for you to have to worry about pleasing me. I says, it's, it's your relationship with the Lord. I said, it's not, she says, I, I'm sorry you're disappointed that I didn't become a Baptist. I said, that's got nothing to do with it. I said, I've got no, I, I said, I don't care in the least that you become a Baptist. I says, what I really care about that is that a person has trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. She said, I've done that. I went to the Billy Graham crusade, and I remember, I'm a born-again Christian. I says, well, she says, but you seem to doubt that in me. I says, a little bit. I says, when a person says that my God can't do something, I said, that doesn't make sense to me. It just doesn't make sense to me. And if we're not careful the way that we act as Christians, when the hard times come, people can get that impression that our God can't handle this. If we get all down in the mouth or down and depressed and discouraged because God has allowed some things to come our way, the, the mindset that we have to have in those situations has to completely change. It doesn't mean, and I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of it just like anybody else, that a lot of times when something comes my way, the first thought that I have is, what did I do wrong? Why am I being punished? Do you, do you have thoughts like that? It's what comes to my mind. But what it really is, is that God is trying to do something in my life. If it is because I'm being punished, then you know what I need? I need to be punished. I need to have my, my eyes open to the fact that I'm doing something I ought not to be doing. And if God has to use chastisement, then that, that's, that's not a bad thing. Did you, you folks that raised children from little, did you ever have to correct them? Did you ever have to maybe give them a spanking? I know that that's against the law nowadays, or supposedly it's just not accepted. But did you ever have to spank your children to correct them? <clears throat> now, I look around the room, and I don't see of anybody in here that I would think 
had pleasure in doing that and, and just w could hardly wait till they could throw that child over their lap so they could smack them in the rear end. I think that the reason you probably did it when you did it is because you loved that child and you knew that they were heading in a, in a bad direction, doing something that they ought not to do, and because you loved them so much, you had to correct them for their sake. Uh, you hear parents say that, it hurts me more than it does you, and a kid doesn't understand that when they're getting spanked, but you know, it, 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 that's the way it works. They don't like doing it, It's not, or most people. I mean, there's some screwballs out there that do love hurting children, but for the most part, a, a loving parent doesn't relish in the fact that he has to correct a child. I don't believe for a minute that God takes pleasure in the fact, for the, for the wrong reason, I should say, that he takes pleasure in having to correct us or having to direct us uh, because he's a meanie. He takes pleasure in it because he knows it's going to get us to the point, just like you when you corrected your kid. He takes pleasure in the fact that if you, if you pay attention to what I'm trying to show you here, it's going to make you more Christ-like. It's going gonna, it's gonna to bless your life. You'll, you'll see that in the, in the last passage that I read, you'll be a blessed person. And that's what he wants. He wants to bless us. Listen again. I'm going to read on here with, with, with the Apostle Paul. I'm going to go back to verse 7 and then read on. Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. This is a problem. It doesn't really state what the problem is, but Paul had some sort of problem, whether it was physical or whatever it was. Uh, I guess it was a physical thing the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. In other words, to keep me humble, I needed this. I was given this to keep me humble. For this thing, I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. If that's hard for somebody to understand, he said he went to the Lord three times in prayer, asked the Lord to take it away. Here was the Lord's answer to him. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. This is the most kindest, gentlest way that you can say no. He said, I'm not taking it away. But he didn't just leave it at a no and let Paul think about something else, or what this could, why, why would God be doing this? He said, my grace is sufficient. He wanted to show Paul that he's going to get grace to deal with whatever he had. And you know what happens when you get a problem? God gives you the grace to deal with the problem. God gives you the ability to get through it. And then he says in this, my strength, God says his strength, is made perfect in weakness. Whose weakness? God's weakness? No, yours and my weakness. My times of weakness is when God can show himself strong in my behalf. You say to yourself, I just can't do it. Some of you folks maybe this morning said, I just can't get up and come to church. But you're here. You know whose strength did that? God in you. God gave you the ability to do that, to overcome what you're feeling, to overcome the discouragement that you have, to overcome the inability that you have. God gave you what you need. And you know, every time that that happens, if you're paying attention to it, you get more and more assured up in the Lord, knowing that it doesn't matter what I face, God will get me through this. You can be more, you can be more and more confident. That's what I see happened to the Apostle Paul here, because listen, right after God told him in the kindest way that I'm not going to take it away, I'm going to give you grace, and, and because I'm going to give you grace, you're going to see my strength made perfect, made complete in you. He says, most gladly, listen to this, most gladly, therefore, I will rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Do you, do you hear what Paul says here? He says, I look forward now to joy, uh, with joy to the fact that I'm going to get to see God's strength in this situation instead of my own. What, what would my strength do in a situation like this? Make me fall? Make me get depressed, make me get discouraged. What does God's strength do? Helps you to rise above it. You know, this is the concern that I have sometimes with listening to people like Mrs. Norris. And I'm not just, I'm not picking on her. But if a person could get a hold of the fact that my God is able to do anything to, to deal with any problem that comes my way, they wouldn't make statements like, they, like I heard her say. Your God can't handle it. This tells me God can handle it. This tells me that God left it there for a reason. I don't know what the reason is. I'm not going to make judgments on it. But it could be that the Lord is just trying to, if she really is saved, and I, I, again, I, I doubt that, because in that same conversation, she said to me, that's not the word of God. She said that was written by man. Now, again, a, a, a true born-again believer, 
Since the time I got saved, I don't know if anybody else has had doubts, but I've never doubted what God said. In fact, I quite honestly never read the Word of God before I got saved. And when I, start, when I was given a copy of, of, actually it was not the right copy, it was a, a perverted copy, but I started reading it because I had never read it before. <clears throat> Brother Joe Williams used to say that, that, that um, I forgot what it's even called now, but that it was made for, it supposedly was the people that made it, wrote it up for handicapped people to be able to understand it better. I don't care if you're handicapped or not. I, I want to say this. There's no perversion out there that's going to help you to understand it better. It's the Holy Spirit. We went through some lessons about the Holy Spirit. Is Holy Spirit the only, only one that can help you to understand what the Word of God says as you read it is the Holy Spirit. There's no Sunday school teacher that can do that. I can, I can stand up here and give a lesson, but unless the Holy Spirit takes what God says and speaks to your heart about it, <clears throat> doesn't mean much what I say. Because I hear preachers, I hear teachers say some things, and they're not necessarily in line with what the Word of God says. And um, I hope that, I hope that a, a person understands that we're a, we're a um, people that stand up and teach or preach. They're, they're, they're human. They're going to make mistakes, but you know what? God never does. So when the Holy Spirit takes what God says and reveals it to you, that's what you need. Uh, the Apostle Paul got a hold of it as soon as Jesus said it to him. He said, most gladly. Now, <laughs> think about this for a minute. They're having this conversation. Paul and, and the Lord are having this conversation. And he just, he just asked them to take it away. And I don't, I don't know, unless I'm misunderstanding this, the response was Jesus told him, I'm not taking it away. I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. He said, I'm going to give you the grace to deal with it, and my strength is going to be made perfect in your weakness. And right there, right then and there, Paul says, okay, most gladly, therefore, I will rather glory. It didn't take him a lot of time to say, well, we'll see. We'll see. I'll see how you do, Lord. I'll see if you give me enough grace to deal with this. He said, okay, most gladly, therefore, I'll, I'll, I'll joy in it. God said it, and I believe it, and I'll just, I'll just relish in it. And it gets better. Verse 10. Therefore, I take pleasure. <laughs> I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. He takes pleasure in them. For when I am weak, then I am strong. What does he mean? For when I am weak, then I am strong. When I'm weak, to, my, to realize that my flesh can't handle this, my mental capacity can't handle this, I just can't handle this. But when God handles it through me, I'm strong. I can stand up to it. I can face it. I can get through it. I know that. Because of Him, not because of me. If I was trying to depend on it myself, you know what I would end up? Probably clinically depressed. I would probably not be able to handle it. But when you're trusting in the Lord, you can say like Paul said, I'm weak, but I'm strong. I'm weak in my own flesh, but I'm strong in the Lord. And I know I can get through this. And then it says in verse, <clears throat> in verse 11, <clears throat> well, let me, let me just stop with verse 10. <clears throat> when I am weak, then I am strong. So why would we count a joy then? Why does, why does it say in the book of James, and, and again, this is James writing it. This is not the Apostle Paul writing it. But he seems to have gotten a hold of it too. He says in verse 2, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. It's not just Paul. James figured it out too. I can, I can joy in this because God's going to do something here. Um, in verse 3, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Uh, he's working in our lives so we can learn patience. Those are hard lessons. What do we need patience for? Well, First one I thought of was patience for God to get us where He wants to get us. Turn to Psalm 37, please, in verse 7. Somebody like to read that? Psalm 37 in verse 7, and then I'll, of course, reread it for the people at home until they can go get their Bibles, pull them out, and follow along. Psalm 37 and verse 7. Let 
verse 7 again, Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of a man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. <clears throat> We're not supposed to be worried about other people that seem like they're just getting along great, and we, we know that they're not living a godly life. In fact, they're not saved at all, and they're wicked, and it seems like they're just prospering from all these things. God says just rest in the Lord. <laughs> don't, worry, don't worry about them. Don't focus on them and think that they're, you know, sometimes people think this. They think because that person is, is not being judged at this moment and that you know that they're, they're, they're living a wicked life, but they're not being judged at this moment. You think that God's blessing them. In fact, I'll be honest, I think that they think that. They think that I must be doing fine. God's blessing me. It doesn't mean God's blessing you. You know, I, I, I don't know if you gather this, but the, the devil can bless you too. If he's got you off track, if he keeps you out of church because he's got you convinced that it's more important to work on Sunday than it is to come to church on Sunday, and you don't really have to, he's got you duped. Now, you're thinking, well, that's the Lord blessing me with this money. I don't believe that. I don't believe Scripture teaches that. My Bible says to keep holy the Sabbath, to turn away my desires on Sunday and, and just focus on the Lord's desires. That's the day we're supposed to do that. In fact, let me see if I can find it real quick. Isaiah. <clears throat> when I want to find it, I probably won't. Oh, I found it. Don't scoff at me. I found it already. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 58. And this, this is what, I've, I've got this underlined, and, I, and again, I go back to this. I read it to you a lot, but just listen to what it says again. If thou, verse 13 of Isaiah chapter 58, If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord honorable, and shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Verse 14. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord had spoken it. My understanding of that and my belief of what that says is that if I honor him with the day, he'll help me to live above my problems. If I focus on my work on Sunday and ignore him, that I think that he's blessing me so I need to make more money, God doesn't care about you making more money on Sunday. God cares about you honoring him with the Sabbath because he said a long time ago in the commandments that it's his day. We're supposed to give it to him. We're supposed to trust him. Why do sometimes people suffer some of the things that they do? Because they've gotten off track in this area. Uh, he's trying to bring us around. Back to Psalm 37. He says, rest in the Lord. You know what the, you know what the Sabbath is supposed to be? It's supposed to be a day of rest. It's supposed to be a day that you get away from that stuff. Now, I know in some people's cases, they have to. But as far as, if it's, make, if it's them making the choice that they have to, or if it's God set them in a position that they have to, that's two different things. I hear people say, that, well, I have to work on Sunday. Do you really? Is there maybe another job you can find? I, I don't think jobs are that hard to find nowadays. Is maybe there not another job that you can find that would give you the day off so you can honor him with what he said here, rest in the Lord and wait for him to work it out? Whose choice is it, really? But if we do, if we, if we, if we listen to what he says, he's going to bring us around to the point of being all that he wants us to be, uh, to get us to where he wants us to be. That takes going through some trials sometimes. Another thing we need patience for, just turn over, if you're in, in, in uh, Psalms, turn over to Psalm 40. And verse 1 <clears throat> says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto, unto me and heard my cry. We have to wait patiently. We need patience when we pray. God doesn't just answer like some people think that you just click your fingers. I can't click my fingers anymore. But they think that if they just click their fingers, God's supposed to respond just because I asked him, he's going to do it right now. Scripture doesn't teach that. It teaches this. I waited patiently for the Lord. And he inclined unto me. And he heard my cry. He heard my prayer. 
But I waited for him to answer the way that he decides to answer. Not the way I think he should answer, but we need patience when we pray. We need to continue to pray and not stop just because it didn't get answered the way we want. You know what else we need patience for? We need patience for God's judgment to come around. I don't know if, if you wonder sometimes about the things that we see going on around us, but it sure seems like they're crazy. It sure seems like a lot of people are getting away with a lot of nonsense, especially today. You think, well, when's, gonna God, when's, when's God going to bring judgment on this? When's God going to do something about it? In his time. And you know what? He doesn't want me to sit and get all stressed about when that time's going to be. See, if I'm worried about when judgment is going to come to those people, you know where my focus is? <clears throat> Honestly, my focus is on those people. My faith is not trusting in him. And those people, by the way, are bringing hard times. There's a lot of, there's a lot of um, injustice going on right now, and, I, and I'm, I'm telling you, I believe it 100% that it's going to creep more and more into the church. There's going to be judgments brought upon us. There's going to be decisions. There's going to be opposition to the Christian where we're going, to have, uh, we're going to feel the results of some of the decisions that people are making right now. And we're going to say to ourselves, well, why would God allow this? Wait, just wait. God will take care of it in his time. He'll set, he'll set the record straight. In Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 8, Yea, in the way of thy judgments, O Lord, have I waited for thee. The desire of our soul is to thy, is to thy name, and to remembrance of thee. We're not supposed to focus on those people during these times and that they're not being judged properly or speedily. We're supposed to keep our focus on him through it all. What does that do? It helps us to display our faith that God will take care of it. I trust him. I trust that he'll take care of these people. He'll, he'll get them to the point that he wants to get them to. You know those people, why they do some of these things? You got these people that are out there rioting and these people that are out there tearing up buildings and burning buildings down and destroying people's, other people's businesses and all this kind of stuff because they're trying to say it's in the name of righteousness. What kind of righteousness acts that way? It doesn't. It doesn't. Now, there's some people that believe that it does, but according to the Word of God, it doesn't. And you know what? I don't like that they do it, but I know who's watching, and I know who's going to take care of it. I know who's going to bring it around, and I just have to be patient that God's judgment is... Is, he's got the right timing in all of that, too. It doesn't have to be in my time. It doesn't even have to be in my lifetime. But he'll take care of it. <clears throat> what I need to be more concerned about is, is my life honoring God while all of this is going on around me? Or have I become a part of it? Or have I let it distract me? Am I focusing on them more than I'm focusing on him? Again, if I, if I am, I don't have the peace that God wants me to have. I'm not displaying the kind of faith that God wants me to display. Because I'm, I'm letting them affect me. And I'm not, I don't want to do that. In Isaiah also, patience again in times of trouble. Isaiah 33 in verse 2. Somebody like to read that? Isaiah 33, 2. God's there for you. I'm telling you. God is there for you. If you're in the midst of trouble, God is there for you. He promised to be. He promised to be. And he'll be our strength. He'll be the one that will uphold us in our times of difficulty. Uh, again, I love this verse. Isaiah 41.10. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Jump down to verse 13. This is a little reminder. For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. When you go through a hard time, God promised to help you. In fact, you know what he said here? He said, I will hold thy right hand. God's not a distant God off up in the heavens that's distant from you and doesn't, doesn't relate to you. He said, I'll hold your right hand. For somebody to hold your right hand, this is my right hand. He's got to be right there to hold it. That's where he is. The Holy Spirit dwells within me. Do I ever have to fear that God is somewhere else and he doesn't know what I'm going through? Never. Never. 
The difficulties that I face, God's right there with me. He's allowed them. He'll help me to get through them. Back to James. James chapter 1 and verse 4. <clears throat> it says, But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Uh, God wants me to learn patience. He wants me to get to be perfect. This perfect doesn't mean perfect without flaw. This perfect, the word means complete. He wants to complete me as a Christian. How is he going to do that? By bringing different trials? By bringing different tribulations? How do, you, how do you complete a student in school? How do you help a student to get prepared in school? Just let them sit there all day and do nothing? Do you, do you, do you give them, I mean, I, I'm not a teacher. Uh, I'm a Sunday school teacher. I'm not a school teacher that way, but uh, I'm not going to give you homework. But how does, a, how does a teacher a lot of times have to get a point across or teach somebody, teach students something? At least all, when I went through school, I don't know what they do anymore, but they gave us homework to take home and do. They didn't want us just to depend on what we learned in the class because a lot of times in class, you know what's happening? If I remember right, you're distracted a little bit by your friends or you're playing around or you're just not paying attention. And they have to send some work home with you so that you learn what they're trying to teach you in class. You're only in class for maybe, I don't even remember what a class lasts. What did it last, half hour, 45 minutes? So they, they send you home with some homework. Do you think they really, I mean, I guess I'm looking on the other side of things now, and I can't answer for every teacher. Do you, do you, I'll just say this. One of the things I realize now that I'm older, why I learned, why I had to do homework, is they were trying to teach me to work through some problems. Whether they be math problems, science problems, they, they were trying to teach me to work through problems. Why does God let something come into your life? He's trying to teach you to work through the problems. <clears throat> now, I guess the, the biggest thing that I would hope you would get from this is that the best way to work through any problem is to run fast to the Lord if, you've, if, you're, in a, if you're at all separated from Him, if you're at all not trusting in Him. Run back and, and let God show you how He's going to work it out. He'll give you what you need to get through. You too can someday say, like Paul said, I, I glory in the fact that I'm facing an infirmity now because I get to see Christ be strong for me. That's what he wants us to, to get to that point. Um, God wants my character to be more and more like Christ. And that's what he's working on. Um, let me just share a few verses with you. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 28. <clears throat> Colossians 1, 28. Whom we preach warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. You know what helps you to become more complete? Preaching. Teaching. You know, people that think that it's not so important to be in church and to be in Sunday school, and I'm, I'm just saying what I believe. I think you're putting yourself at a disadvantage. I think that you have an opportunity to get shored up, as I'm talking about, shored up in the Lord, strengthened in the Lord, so when the tough times do come. You know, I said this last week as a Sunday school teacher, as a pre anybody that preaches, you're supposed to prepare people. You're supposed to try to get them shored up. You know, uh, and I'll use this, this comparison. Maybe it's not a good comparison, but when you have a coach coaching a sport or you have maybe a coach, somebody's coach coaching you at, at doing exercises or whatever they may be doing. They're trying to teach you so that you could be prepared to do what you're supposed to do. If you're, if you're let's just say you're a football coach. You, you have somebody that's teaching you on how to play that position. I've never played football, but I know that they're teaching you how to play that position. So when the time comes, it's one thing to do it at practice. It's another thing when you're facing opposition to continue to follow through. It's the same thing here. I can stand here and say this. You can read the Word of God and, and, and know that you're supposed to do something, but it's a whole other thing when the opposition comes, when the trial comes, on how you respond to that. And I want to tell you, the best way you can respond to that is trust what God said in it. Just keep that in mind. That's why preaching is important. That's why teaching is important. That's why I think people that stay home and don't come 
again, I, I don't mean to upset people. If you can come, you ought to come. If you're making an excuse on why you can't come, you're putting yourself at a disadvantage. I believe if you really can't come, honestly, I think God will give you what you need. But if you're making an excuse, and only two people know that, you and him, if you're putting, putting, yourself, you're putting yourself at a disadvantage, God wants you to listen to what preaching says and what teaching says so that he can strengthen you and get you ready for the position that you're supposed to hold. As a Christian, you're supposed to hold fast in the Lord when opposition faces you and not get all scared and worried and nervous and fearful. We're not supposed to do that. That fear doesn't come from God. He gives us a, 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 a different disposition. We don't have to be afraid. And God doesn't want us to be afraid. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1. <clears throat> Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and a faith toward God. Now, I don't know if this verse applies the way that you see it, but I just wrote here, don't ever retreat in your Christian life. Don't go backwards. Keep moving forward. Keep moving forward. Same, ch same book, chapter 10, verse 38. It says, Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. God doesn't want us to draw back. He's doing a work in you. I'll say it again at the beginning. Trials are an important part of life. Trials are the way we're going to learn to be more Christ-like. Yeah, you can learn them. You can learn them in, in different ways, but I'll just say this. Trials are, are one of the ways that God uses he doesn't want you to think negative all the time about trials when they come your way. I, don't, I, don't, I know that people talk about that, and they, they maybe even preach it or teach it, that, uh, oh, you just got to bear through the trials. You know, when I hear Paul say that he rejoiced in them and looked forward to them, there's something different what was happening in Paul's life. And when James said you, you should look to it with, with, how did he say it, with all pleasure? Um... My brethren, count it all joy. Count it all joy. They're saying count it all joy. They're saying they look forward to it. And you got other people standing around telling you, oh, oh, you got to bear these things. Oh, they're tough to bear. There's something different there. It's the mindset. Either you believe that God allowed it, either you believe that God's going to use them, or you, or you don't. You think that you, in the back of your mind, I guess, you think you did something to matter, and that, uh, why is God doing this to me? I'll tell you why he's doing it to you. He loves you. He's trying to make you more Christ-like. That's why he did it to you. I didn't say, I should, I'm saying that in the wrong way. Why did he allow it? Because he loves you, and he's trying to make you more Christ-like. And that's the way he chooses to do it. You say, that's not the way I would choose to do it. You know, it really doesn't matter what way you would choose. God's got the better way. He's always got the better way. Ecclesi Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and verse 14. <clears throat> Verse 14 of Ecclesiastes chapter 3, it says, I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it, and men should fear before him. You know what God does? God completes what he starts. We as individuals sometimes start something, get a little weary, or whatever the reason, change our minds, and we don't follow through. I want to say to you that God follows through. When God starts a work in you, God will complete a work in you. And you know what? I don't care how old you are. He's still working on you. You haven't arrived. I don't care how many degrees you have. You have not arrived. And God will continue to do what he needs to do to make you more Christ-like, to make you the way that he wants you to be. And he'll use whatever means he chooses to. Where faith comes in is just trusting that. It's just that simple. You just trust it because God's allowed it. You just trust it because you know God loves you. You just trust it because God's been around a lot longer than you have. He knows the way to get you there. James chapter 1 again in verse 5. <clears throat> if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not. 
and it shall be given unto him. We need to humble ourselves before God and ask for wisdom, his wisdom. Realize that you don't have all the answers. I don't, again, I'll go back to this. I don't care how much education you got. You don't have the answers. Every, every situation is different. I don't know. I, I've not done counseling. I've talked to people sometimes to try to help them through some things. But, you know, I just don't have the answers. And I know that those counselors that go to all this schooling and everything, they don't have the answers. And unless they're using the Word of God, unless they're taking somebody to the Word of God, those answers aren't going to solve anything. I've been to some counselors in times past before I got saved. I, I went to some counselors to talk about some things, but they don't have no answers. What they're trying to do, what they're trying to do is, is in, a, in a person's life, psychiatrists, psychologists, and I can't speak for all of them, but I think so, un unless they're Christians. Here's what they're trying to do in a person's life. Balance. Keep this balance. Person is getting depressed. They don't want this person to fall into depression, so they try to balance them back out so that they can walk this way. You know what God's trying to do? Get you over your problem. Get you through the problem. Get it solved. They can't do it. God can. And that's what he wants to do in our lives. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Somebody would like to read that. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Okay, I'll read it then. Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in prayers. This is, again, the Apostle Paul talking about praying for one another. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. You need to know more about Him. You need His wisdom. If you're lacking that, what did he say in James? I'll read it again. If you lack it, what we're supposed to do? What are we supposed to do? Just ask for it. Just ask for it. God's not going to withhold it from you. He just wants you to simply ask. Whenever I try to prepare a Sunday school lesson, I just have to admit to the Lord, I don't know. I don't know which way to go with this. I don't know what to pen. And I need your help. I need your wisdom. That's what I ask for. That's what a... Anybody's supposed to ask for in any decision. I'm not just saying it because of Sunday school teacher. That's what you're supposed to ask for. You're supposed to pray for it. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 9. <clears throat> for this cause, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. You know, we're supposed to pray for ourselves, but we're supposed to pray for wisdom for one another. You know, when you know somebody's facing a, a difficult situation, something has come into their life, and we pray for them, God help them through it, God give them wisdom. We're supposed to pray for God to give that person wisdom so that that person can make the right choices while they're in the midst of their trial or their tribulation or their hard time. Pray for the other person that God would give them wisdom. They're supposed to be asking for it too. But I would, I, would, I would say that in understanding this, that God wants us to pray for other people to have wisdom too. James chapter 1 and verse 6, But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like the wave of the sea, driven of the wind and tossed. Don't doubt that God can do anything. You know, I, I guess I, I can't... I can't forget when somebody, like what that woman said, that God can't, your God can't. Let, let me read Jeremiah 32, 27. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? I'm not going to listen to what that lady says. I'm not going to believe what she says. Somewhere along the line, I don't know, somebody must have said something to her. She believes God can't. My Bible says, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. And then he asked the question, is there anything too hard for God? Is there anything, anything that you face in your life, is there anything whatsoever that's too hard for God to handle? If you think there is, you're mistaken. I'll just tell you, I'll just tell you as a Sunday school teacher, you're mistaken. But I'll tell you as the word of God, you're, you're gravely mistaken. 
There's nothing that's too hard for God to handle. And he wants us to trust him through it all. Um, God would like our faith to be unwavering. The temptation to waver will come. But don't let it draw you away. I'm not, you're going to face that. You're going to face times where God wants you to follow through and you're going to waver. You're going you're to falter. But don't. Don't. Trust what he says. Believe in him being the God of all flesh that can do anything that you face. <clears throat> Listen to what it says in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 12. And sadly, we're going to see this. I think we're seeing this a little bit already. Verse 12 of Matthew 24 says, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. I hate to say it, but I think the devil duped a lot of people into thinking you don't have to go to church anymore. I think the devil has tricked a lot of people into thinking you don't need Sunday school. I'm not saying it because I'm standing up here as a Sunday school teacher. When I first got saved, I didn't know what Sunday school was because I grew up as a Catholic and I never had Sunday school. But ever since I got saved and I knew there was such a thing as a Sunday school, I haven't missed it unless I was sick. I taught it to younger people. I taught it in here, and I didn't miss it. You know why? Because I believe what God said. It's important. And I know that what happens, it's going to happen, because iniquity will abound, and we're seeing more and more of that, the love of many shall wax cold. The love for God, the love for the things of God, the love for the Word of God is going to wax cold. The devil has tricked a lot of people into staying out of church. has gotten them to go cold. You say, well, that's not the reason I stay out. <clears throat> I'll just ask you the question, you answer it to God. What is the reason? What is the reason you're staying out? You afraid? What are you afraid of? I said this from the very beginning when, when uh, COVID hit. What are you afraid of? As a Christian, I hear a lot of people say, oh, I can hardly wait till I go home to be with the Lord. Well, maybe COVID is an avenue to get there. We can laugh about it, but God can use COVID to get me to the other side. He can use a heart attack. He can use me getting hit by a car. He can use me hit by lightning. He can use whatever way he wants. But am I supposed to, if he, if he wants to use lightning, am I supposed to be afraid to walk outside every time it's raining and possible lightning? If he wants to use a, a car accident, am I supposed to stay out of my car and be afraid to drive a car? Well, why is it that all of a sudden COVID comes along and I got to be afraid? I'm not going to be afraid. And you shouldn't be afraid. If COVID keeps you from doing the things that God wants you to do, I would say that you're living on the wrong side of things. You're letting the world influence you, the fear influence you, instead of God influencing you. God wants us to stand firm in Him, not be afraid of things. Um, a double-minded, this, this is talking about a double-minded person. <clears throat> in verse 8, double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways means they can't make up their mind. They're going back and forth. Just two verses. I know, Bob said, I'm, I'm, I waited till, 10, till 10.30 to say it. So they, <laughs> Say it right. Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9 and verse 62. Luke chapter 9 and verse 62. Jesus saith unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow... And looking back is fit for the kingdom of heaven. God doesn't want us to be double-minded and think, well, i got to change things now because COVID came. You don't think that God knows that? You don't think that the people lived back in Jesus' days that, that had leprosy? Do, do, you think, do you think that they were afraid? I mean, they were cast out from the, the people, but do you think that Jesus was afraid to walk up to them and, 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 and talk to them or, or give them the gospel? Or Do you think we're supposed to be afraid of all of this? I don't think so. James chapter 4 and verse 8. I know I made a lot of people mad at me now at home. It says, Draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. You know what you need? If you're so afraid, get close to Jesus. Get closer to Jesus, and then you won't have to be afraid. If you understand, if you can sense the love that God has for you, if you can sense the, 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 
right from what I said from the very beginning when we were talking about the Apostle Paul. If you can sense the fact that God knows what he's doing and God has your best interest at heart, you don't have to be afraid of any opposition you face. You don't have to be afraid of any COVID. You don't have to be afraid of cancer. You don't have to be afraid of anything. This is, remind yourself, this is the temporary side of things. You're not going to live here for all of eternity. If you've trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you will live in heaven with Him for all of eternity. When a person's graduation day comes is not something we know. You know, when you went to high school, you knew that when you finished the 12th grade, if you did what you're supposed to do, you're going to graduate. You know when you were in grade school, at least the grade school I was in, that when you reached and finished eighth grade, you know you were going on to high school. You know when graduation was. This thing of graduating to eternity, no, nobody knows when that is. Nobody has an idea when that is. We're not supposed to be fearful of the, of the path all along. I told, you, I told you this back when I first went to, uh, when I graduated out of grade school and I went to high school, they took me to interview at the different high schools, or at least we did at that time. And I heard one of the teachers mention, well, I think he should be in college prep. It brought fear to my heart. I didn't want to do anything college. College wasn't in my mind. More school wasn't in my mind. I wanted to do something. I wanted to work. I wanted to do something else. But you know, I spent a good part of the first year of high school fearful of what awaited me. And it didn't await me. I, I'm standing on this side of things. I ended up graduating high school and going to barber school. I ended up being a barber. I didn't have to worry about college, but I did. I wasted a long time worrying about going to college, and it never happened. You know, there's a lot of people waste a lot of time worrying about this and worrying about that. You don't know that it's going to happen. Your, your sights are supposed to be on him in the middle of COVID. Your sights are supposed to be on him in the middle of any kind of situation. Your sights are supposed to be on him, not on something else. Let me finish out. Verse 9 and 10. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, and the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. God knows how to bring balance to your life. If you're too high, he can bring you low. If you're too low, he can bring you high. He can balance it out for you. And we're not supposed to, again, we're not supposed to fret on that. I know people that just constantly complain about they're not being treated fair. They're not being treated fair. It's, it's just not fair to them. God's fair. I'll close with verse 12, I promise. It says, Blessed is a man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord had promised to them that love him. The one that can learn to trust God, that person will be blessed. Do you want to be blessed? Probably the answer in the room is yes. Then learn to trust God, no matter what the situation is. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this lesson. Thank you, Lord, for the trials that come our way. I would love to get to the point that the Apostle Paul got to where he just actually looked forward to those times because he knew he got to see you in a way that he never saw you before. He could see you manifest yourself to him personally in each one of these trials and tribulations that he faced. Lord, we should look forward to it, not fear it. We should not run from it. We should run to it. I just pray that you'd help us to have the kind of an attitude, the kind of a disposition the kind of a love for you that we ought to have, especially in these times as they seem to be getting darker. We ask for your help to do that. In Jesus' name I pray and for his sake. Amen. Love y'all. Enjoy. Oh, there's some goodies up there. There are some goodies. If there's somebody out there that really loves them sconchy things, you can take a whole box home. Scoonchies, whatever they're called.